Okay, we are live. Uh, thank you for joining our webinar today. We are presenting the Gray Way Ado um, Adoption, A New Start with Lisa Bono. Uh, welcome, Lisa. Hi. Hey. Hi. Thanks for having so, me. Well, it's great to have you back. Um, I'm sure we'd have a lot of great questions today, as well as a great presentation. So, um, so Lisa, while we wait for people, I, I see some some flock behind some some African greys behind you. You want to tell us who's who and and uh, they are all just doing their thing right now. It's really cute. Yes. Um, last seminar or last webinar, we had Abby that was directly behind me, but she was being very antsy. And so I had to move her out of the way and keep an eye on her because she likes or she tries to get in the drawer that is underneath the computer right now. So um, I'm trying to keep everybody a little bit calmer by having Abby over here. Let's see where she is. This is Abby. Oh, wow. Right on cue. Yeah, right on cue, because she wants to come down to the computer. Sterling is directly behind me, kind of here. This is Emma, one with a twisted neck. And then we have Sam over here that's chewing. And then behind them, you can't really see, is Sydney, and he's busy too. That's my baby. All these guys were pretty much older when I got them, so that's why they're in the forefront. And do they get along? Are they are they are they happy being in each other's presence, but not necessarily with each other? Yes, they'll talk to each other, but I can't really have them touching. That's why I was trying to make sure that everybody is far enough apart that they can't climb on another tree when I'm focusing someplace else. So <laughs> they get along talking, but not no, not to be with each other. So um, well, they're behaving really well right now. I'm just, I'll keep an eye out behind you and let you know. I'll, I'll give you a, a sign if they uh, crawl over to someone else's play gym. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> so, so um, let's see. Okay, so if you're just joining us, you're at the Gray Way Adoption, uh, a new start with uh, Lisa Bono. And um, just a reminder that uh, if you have any questions we'll, the, the, towards the end of the web, we'll try to get to them at the, towards the end of the webinar. So use the Q&A button and not the chat feature so we can capture the questions. And um, let's see, I think that's pretty much the main thing right now. So if you have a question, use the Q&A function button to put it in there. And um, Lisa, I think you have a great uh, uh, PowerPoint for us, so. Yes, I do. So let me let me get it open here and All right. take Either it from I'm really there. I'm excited to see this, so. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, how's that? I can see it perfectly. Okay, excellent. Um, now, do you see along the bottom? Do you see the bar, or is that just on my end? Um, I don't see a bar. Okay, because I do, and I just want to make sure it's not covering anybody. Okay, so welcome everybody to this webinar on adoption. Um, I am very pro adoption. The majority of my birds through the years have come to me later in life, and they've been some excellent teachers. So I hope someday you will consider, if you have a baby, opening your heart and home to an, a, an older bird in need because there's so many of them out there. So some people may be surprised, but this was actually my first large parrot. This is from 1990. And this was an orange wing Amazon that lived with my client. I was a manicurist, lived with my client for probably 10, 15 years. And I never even knew it. So one day she came in and we were talking about it. And I had birds all over my station. So, you know, I had things to talk about. Um, she came in and she had mentioned she had a bird and, you know, she didn't spend a lot of time with it. Um, and I adopted Polly. Now, prior to this, I had cockatiels, canaries, parakeets. So this was my first large bird. I was told you could not handle her. She was nasty. She would bite. Um, what do I know? I'm in my early 20s, so probably 21 or 22. And so I bring her home. And for a year, I was terrified of her. And I would use a glove like I was told. I would use a towel. One day I just decided I was going to be brave and give her my hand and this bird stepped up. She was so friendly, so calm and so sweet that this picture here is me taking her to school 
to teach children about the rainforest and about birds. So one person may think the bird is very mean, wants to find a, a home, doesn't have necessarily a good relationship, but that does not mean that the bird is not going to do fantastic in your home and be a great companion. This is actually my first African gray in 91, and this was Otis, and a lot of people don't know I had a Timna either. Um, I just love them. And he was also the same thing. He was, I can't tell you how many homes he's been through before he came to me. And the same description was given. He's mean, you can't handle him, he's nasty. Let me tell you, he would go along with me to school and teach kids. He had never bit anybody and never attempted. He would push you away with his beak. So this is kind of what started me down the gray route. When we had Otis, we actually bought a baby. Uh, my, my boyfriend, now husband, bought me a baby and this was my Sam. So this is something that I molded, I created from a little baby. And as you can see, this is Sam and Otis. Now I have this terribly nasty little bird over here that's the Timna, supposedly, and this hand-fed baby that I molded. And you can see, we did the same things together. Sadly, my joy didn't last very long because Samson died at the age of two and a half. I wanted to go adoption since I had such great results with my other two birds. I wanted to do an adoption and I went to a couple different rescues at that time and sadly, I was denied. I can only wonder what happened to those birds through the years. Um, in 2002, we didn't have a lot of rescues to turn to. There were very few, mainly through bird clubs, because a lot of the birds were importated and, and you know, they were going to a lot of breeders. People didn't have them as long. Um, and so it was a little harder to find them. So we bought another bird. And this is actually, this ugly little creature is Sydney at his breeders. Anyone can bring home a baby. The only requirement really is money, okay? But it takes a special person to open their heart to a bird in need. Now on the left here, you'll see Cookie. And Cookie was actually um, relinquished because of terrible seizures. Cookie is with a friend of mine and is doing wonderful in her care. And I just love that little picture of her. Uh, the next the bird to the right is Piper. And Piper used to live in a gift store. They found out that it's a little too dusty to be in a gift store. So Piper was rehomed. Most people choose to adopt after the loss of a companion parrot or gaining experience from their own and learning from other people. They realize and find out more about rescues. Um, they, they donate their time, they go there, or somebody knows that they have a parrot and all of a sudden you become the crazy parrot lady of the community and everybody wants you to take their birds in. The reasons birds end up needing new homes varies. And it's not always because they're mean and not Hannibal. A lot of times they could be behavior issues. You could have the illness or death of a caregiver. The owner's relocating and can't take the bird. Change in the family unit. They have babies or mom moves in or something you know, like that. The family simply no longer wants the bird. Financial issues, we can all relate to that with COVID. The birds did not eat, meet the owner's expectations. They wanted a talking sweet baby bird and guess what? They, they feel they didn't have it. So now the bird's gotta go. And lastly, redecorating. Um, actually, I've had people come up to me and want me to take their birds because for instance, their uh, Malukan cockatoo no longer 
matched their peach living room. So the bird had to go. There are some behavioral issues that cause, can cause an issue and birds might need a new home. This can include biting, screaming, aggression, feather destruction, and destroying property. Now notice that's my Sydney there on the left. You notice that little look he's given. That's because Sydney has bit me harder than any of my adoptive birds ever have. I don't think he realizes he's a bird and he gets very, very um, testy at times. You have, these are some of the biting and screaming, but know that these behaviors are avoidable. There's so many things you could do to work and change the outcome. Know that Emma was just yawning here, um, but it was a good picture. You have to learn body language, and we've gone through that with my second webinar. Some behavior is a little harder to pinpoint, and, and it's very important to make sure you speak with your veterinarian to rule out medical issues. Any of these birds could be going through, you know, separation or nervousness or anything like that. But for instance, my little guy, this is Otis towards the end. He was sick and he picked right on his stomach. Um, he was having problems with his liver towards the end. So unless you go to the vet and make sure that the medical issues are ruled out, we can't give you sound advice as a consultant to say, try this, try this, try this. We want to see proof your bird is healthy and then we can help you from there. Now, I, I would like everybody to take a moment to read this. This is out on the internet and hopefully um, people will think about this when they're looking to find a companion parrot. This is, you're able to find this pretty easy online. The birds you see in these pictures have all been rehomes. These are all from my gray page. People have sent me pictures with little stories about them. So you're looking to adopt and you're not sure how to go about it. There's a lot of different avenues out there now that were not there when I was looking. So you wanna check with your local bird club. Know there's a lot of them out there. You just have to look, okay? I have these two down here, the Long Island Parrot Society and Florida West Coast Avian Society because they both both have me in as a speaker. And I know that they do adoptions and placement. And just about every club out there has people call them with birds. Check with your veterinarian's office. They may have somebody that can no longer care for their bird and they, they relinquish them to a vet. There might be you know, a bird you're looking there that needs a home, so contact them. Then you have rescues. There's a lot of them now and they are all over. Now I don't personally know everybody here, but they've come recommended from my, my gray group and a lot of the people on the page have adopted from them. A lot of people say that rescues have restrictions or make it very hard to adopt. And there's a reason for that. The rescues aren't there to make you happy. They're there to make sure they put the bird in the best home and it's safe for the bird. That's their goal. They want to make sure that bird is, is not sitting in a the closet. They want to make sure the bird isn't let loose. This, the, all this kind of stuff happens. They want to make sure that you are going to protect the bird. You're not going to just take them outside without a harness or being protected from the elements. So I know a lot of people get upset um, because there are restrictions, but I am happy there are restrictions because I do a lot of adoptions as well. And I'm not just going to give a bird to somebody who, who's the first person jumping up and down, waving their hands saying they want to take a bird. Um, also, there's going to be a fee. And the adoption fee is because you are, the, when, when rescue takes a bird in, they have to take it to their vet. So they're acquiring all these medical bills and they can't just keep paying for this. 
So they would go bankrupt right away. And these, these rescues, a lot of times they're like me and you. They see so many birds in need and this is what they're gonna do. So the adoption there is, it, the fee is there for a reason. The restrictions are there for a reason. If you're really looking for a bird, you won't have a problem with any of that. And if you were trying to find your bird at home, you would hope that the rescues do the same thing. Now, how do you pick an older companion? I wouldn't necessarily go on Craigslist or Facebook or anything like that. Sadly, there are so many scams and daily basis we hear people's money being stolen. You want to find, like I said, a rescue, your vet, or whatever. And then if you go there and there's quite a few birds, how do you pick one? You let them pick you, if possible. And you will know if you have a connection. If you go in there and a bird is carrying in the corner and growling and doesn't want to come near you, it's probably not going to be a good fit. If you walk in there and a bird comes over to you and starts bringing your hair or talking to you, that looks like it may be a good, good fit. Now you have adopted an older bird into your home. Where do you start? What do you need to learn? And how do you nurture the relationship you chose to start? Answer is start slow. Get rid of your expectations. Work together. Don't push. Don't rush. And work at the bird's pace, not yours. Don't get a bird because you want it to speak. You know, that's, that's just a, the icing on the cake. But you hear that all the time with, with African greys. People want them because they speak. Not all birds speak. I have two that don't say anything. Sometimes people who adopt don't take the time to tr figure out what the bird is thinking or feeling. They know they're a good person. They take this bird home. They stick their hand in and you have a terrified bird. They don't know why they're there. You expect them to be nice. And then you're surprised because they either back up or you get bit. You have to try to think what this new bird is thinking and feeling. And my goal is to make you think that way. You might be the best person in the world, but the bird does not know that. You have to prove it to them. We have to understand any fear the bird may have and how to overcome it. Everything in their world has changed and they don't understand why. Many homes are lost due to no fault of their own could be a death or it could be a separation. We do this not so they just adjust to their homes, but thrive in them. Remember when you're working with a bird or you're getting to know a bird that every interaction is a learning experience for both of you. Not every interaction has to be a teaching lesson. Reading, dancing, singing are fun too. Each fun interaction is a reward in itself. Coming out, being given special foods, going to a special place, that's what they want to do. It's a reward. Make learning fun. Be fun. Don't be afraid to be animated if it works. I'm pretty sure my neighbors think I'm crazy because they can see me dancing and singing and carrying on with everybody, and I really don't care. Work in shorter sessions. Don't drag it on because you want to. Work at the bird's pace. Watch their body language. Make sure they're comfortable, not at your pace. Watch body language. Make sure they're comfortable with your interactions. Always end on a positive note. Punishment does not work and it's not ending on a positive note. Find that sweet spot and work together. Behavior is a study of one. What, what may work for me may not work for you. So that's why you have to figure out what's best with the information you're given. When you get a bird home, I want you to remember this as well. Be, be patient, acknowledge good behavior, show respect, encourage a relationship, always offer love and build trust. And again, one of the most important things, you're always gonna hear me say this, is to watch those eyes. If you have eyes that are round, doesn't matter if they're pins, doesn't matter if they're wide, these birds right here are pretty much on the top row, fine, they're comfortable, they're at peace. 
These guys down here on the bottom, when they're squinting, their eyes have this shape to them. No, you're usually gonna get bit, okay? They're not happy with the interaction. They're overexcited or they're just determined to get you. Now, I can tell you four of the ones on the bottom are mine. Conrad is not. But you can see, even in my home, they're allowed to have their own thoughts and feelings. They are living, breathing creatures. And if they're not in a mood, be respectful of that. Now, when you get your bird home, what are you going to do? Um, over here, we have Jen. And a lot, what she did with her boys is she brought them home. These both of her boys are disabled. They have no feet. Um, so things are a little bit different, but she wanted them to feel comfortable. So it's not necessarily that you have to let the bird out right away. The bird has got to get used to you. If you see, if you see in his eyes that the bird is calm, you may want to do what Gail is doing over here. She looks very happy with Livingston. Um, again, all these birds were adopted. So she just opened a door and he looks like he may have a perch on the door. Um, and that's interaction. You're showing the bird that you're safe. Jen was offering food. She was sitting next to the cages. Bird in the middle is actually Abby when she first came home, letting her get used to the sounds and noises of my house uh, before I just let her out and let her go nilly willy. Um, she was not living with any other grays. So I didn't know if she ever saw one before. So it was just safer to let her be in her cage, know that she was in quarantine and we were waiting for her tests to come back. Then what you wanna do, once you see they're calm, you wanna teach them to station. And this simply is just to a spot, get them to a spot that they wanna interact with you that you know they're calm, all right? So you can see that on my doors, these are all my birds, I have a perch directly in the middle of the door. So what I'll do is I will teach them to come over to this spot, little by little. You can either target train, you can give you know a treat if you want. I use good boy and good girl all the time. Mine respond much better to that. And I've found that African greys respond much better to that than anything else where an Amazon is gonna do fantastic with food. They'll do anything for food. So I teach them to come to this spot. And then once I see that they're comfortable, I'll start to open the door just a little bit. Now this is progress. It might only be open an inch one day and I'll watch and see how they go. And some birds are completely fine with just opening a door altogether. You have to watch the body language. This is Abby. She doesn't have a perch on her door, but she has a perch right in front of the door. So if she wants to come out, if any of them want to come out, they come to this perch. It's my cue that they're ready to come out and they're happy. If she's on her perch up here, I'll let her be. I'll take the other birds out first. So when she's on this perch, that's come get me. Then when you have them out, you're going to work on step up. And it's easier a lot of times if you work with them away from the cage. Uh, you may want to, if they, if they get scared and spooked and fly and land on the floor, instead of picking them right up and begging them back to the cage, I would pick them up and maybe bring them to the arm of the sofa and sit there and just interact. Um, there are some good products out there as well. For instance, this is the Buddy Perch. This is made by a friend of mine and it was, one was given to me actually for my kayak because he is the little terror of the house. So um, this is great because it's got the acrylic and they can't reach around the acrylic to get you. So you wanna work on stepping up. As you can see, Abby up here, she is very interested in getting up. Uh, she, was, she had long legs when she wants to. Emma was a little bit more nervous here, but she was you know, looking at herself in the mirror. Um, and it's also good with the perches, whether you use you know a towel put on your hand or a regular long stick or the buddy perch, it's great to have any bird 
being used to this. So this way, if somebody has to take care of your bird in your absence, the bird is used to it and they can handle them safely. If you have a scared bird and a scared, say, mother coming in to take care of your birds, you, you need to make a happy medium there. Um, and if they're used to something else to step on besides a human hand, then guess what? Then you should not have a problem. They'll do it for them, they'll do it for me. My guys are used to stepping up on a towel and they're used to the buddy perch. Now, for instance, my last seminar with Abby behind me, she was very antsy and moving around. And um, I actually had to use something to get her back to her cage because she was so worked up, probably from the sound of the computer, looking at the computer, the flicker on the computer, that she was just gonna bite and you could see it in her eyes. So I used something to get her up and we were fine. Now, what you can do, as I mentioned before, instead of taking the bird right back to say the cage, if it lands on the floor, you can have something else set up, set up and put them on there. Now, this was a situation with Emma, who has never seen a little running, screaming little thing shorter than me in the house. This is my husband's granddaughter and Sarah wanted to interact with Emma and Emma wanted nothing to do with her. So this was the top of Emma's cage I put on my coffee table and I had Sarah sit down and read her and show her pictures. And I can tell you within about 20 minutes of Emma being on the very far perch right here, within 20 minutes, she was down on the corner here, ripping up the pages on the book. So it was just time getting used to each other. Now this is Tiki. Same thing, Tiki was getting used to something smaller with more energy running around the house than what he's used to. So it doesn't always have to be touchy, feely. It can be just interaction. And that's a wonderful interaction right there. Remember, good boy and good girl go a really long way with grace. So use it often and don't be surprised if when you do something they like, they'll tell you a good boy or a good girl. Now, these are all birds off of my forum that have been rehomed. I've actually facilitated some of these and I'm, I'm always thrilled to see that they're doing well in their home. And you can see that I, I didn't have the information for Sophie. So Sophie's up there because I know she was adopted, but all the other reasons they were put up for adoption is underneath their name. You can't really see one saying behavior. It's usually a reason that is no fault of their own. Now you have these birds that were in a home. They were probably very loved and the people passed away and now their family doesn't know what to do with them. And they end up in different homes. Now this bird doesn't understand why his human is not around doesn't understand why the walls are different, the people are different, what's that dog, they don't have a clue. And they need to be, you know, taking time and get used to the situation. Here are some more. And again, um, you don't really see that, oh, my bird was screaming or biting, I had to get rid of him. Um, you're gonna see, I just had to mention Una over here. <sighs> She only has one leg. So she spends her time resting. Um, she was at a younger age um, bitten by a dog. And she was taken in by a veterinarian and the veterinarian passed away and the next owner took her in. So she's a very spoiled little girl. The disabled ones do fantastically with the right environment and, and love. And here we have Sammy and Thumper down here again, special able, no feet doing fantastic. I do have to mention this one because this is my Sam. And the only reason this got put in here is because I took a picture of her for um, the webinar talking about adoption. She was adopted. Um, and when I looked at the picture, I saw that she had a rainbow on her. Now I took another picture like a second later and it did not have this rainbow. So I have a feeling that her mom, Trudy, who was very good friends with me and that I adopted her from was watching. And this is Sammy's little adoption picture. 
Again, these are some of my best teachers. This was Otis when he first came to me. You can see what a mean, terrifying bird he was. He was a fantastic companion. This is Sterling. When I got him, now he did stay with my family. I am embarrassed to say this is a picture from my dad's house. My dad was sick and had a stroke. And by the time I got there to take care of him, um, this is the condition of Sterling's house. So he came to live with me. And you can see Sterling's with me at 23. He's gonna be 40. I can get a harness on him. He is a wild caught import. I can get a harness on him. He goes for rides with my husband um, in the golf cart. This is Abby. I showed you the little picture of her when she first came home. This is her regular cage. When she got used to everybody, again, 14 years old, I was able with trust, I didn't do anything special with any of these birds. With trust, patience, and time, you can see, she's got a little hoodie on for Halloween. She has a harness on. And this is Sammy, again, she was 26. Her mom actually got me this adoption free many years ago. 26 years old, came to live with me. Never had a harness on. I find out she never would flip over for, you know, the past owner. She'll do it for me. And I'm not sure if it's because she sees the other birds doing it or if it's just we've built that bond where she's not afraid. This is Emma. Emma came to me about nine months of age and I just had to put her in there because she's just so cute and everybody loves her. So this is just some of her goofy photos through the years. These are some of the owners on the page. Again, I've used a lot of their pictures before. Um, every single bird you see here was adopted. So you can see, never discount an older bird that needs a home because they can be terrific companions. I asked on my page if people would change their mind about adopting a bird if they knew now or you know what you know now if you knew it then every single one of them these are quotes every single one of them would not change that they adopted an older bird you have to remember with working with any bird especially an older one that's confused scared everything else that trust is earned, not given. A lot of people right away expect because they're a good person that the bird is going to know that they're a good person. It's not the way it works. Now, what's the difference between a rescue and a sanctuary? A lot of people will say, well, I contacted this place and they don't adopt birds out. They just keep them. No, the, the, the difference between them is a rescue is a temporary placement for a bird before it finds a home. A sanctuary is a place that birds go and they stay. The owners may make a donation for lifetime care, which hopefully they do, um, but the birds are well taken care of and loved. And they stay there. They don't go any place different. Sometimes if the rescues and sanctuaries are overwhelmed, they will reach out to see if they can place some birds versus just telling somebody no, because we never want to tell anybody no. Sanctuaries that you're probably aware of. Um, I've been to Project Perry. I can't wait to get out to East. We have foster parrots. I have their shirt on today. Unfortunately, they just had a tragic fire and they've lost a lot of birds and it's been all over the internet. I've been there. I've been down by Birds of Paradise, and I have not been west yet to the Oasis or the Gabriel Foundation. But these are some of the ones that I have known through the years and that I support. Maybe you're considering adopting. You're on the fence. Um, you don't know what you can do. There's a ton of things you can do. You can volunteer at a local rescue. They always need help. With COVID, it might be a little bit different because they're not letting people in, but you may be able to do something off the grounds, even something as simple as raking the grounds is, is one thing less they have to do. 
you can donate. Always doesn't mean money. It might mean cleaning supplies. It might mean food. Again, these people a lot of times are just like you and me that don't want to say no, have so many birds and decided this is what they're going to do with their life. You can sponsor a bird. There's a lot of them out there. And um, I know we've sponsored a few on my page and we've been able to name the birds if they didn't have birds. And again, if they have birds that need to come in because again, with COVID, a lot of them had halted, they might need a foster home to help out. Those are all fantastic things you can do. Now, I also help and facilitate with birds. These are two that I'm helping right now find homes for. So if you think you may be interested, reach out to me and I'll give you the information I need, um, your references, all that kind of stuff. Reach out to me and we'll go from there. Keep this in mind. I've had this on my emails for probably 25 years. Helping one bird won't change the world, but it will change the world for that one bird. And every bird that I have behind me, their worlds have changed. And this is the final slide, but I also want to tell you is I don't want anybody thinking that I am against breeders because I'm not. I am all for good breeders, not the backyard ones. Um, I think it's important we have them out there. And if you're looking for a baby, I suggest you search out the good people. Um, and one more thing. I received an email today from Nikki, and I know she's probably watching. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you for the email, and I'm very happy things are going well with Kippy. Um, that made my day. So I appreciate everybody being here, and I'm going to stop sharing, and we'll take some questions. Okay. All right. Thank you. That was awesome. Um, let's see what our first question is, for you, Lisa. Um, oh, this, yes, I actually had this question too. Uh, so Mar Marquetta asks, uh, how, to, how to introduce a new bird to the one that is already at home? Okay, so most important thing is to make sure the bird's been quarantined, okay, because of communicable diseases. And then I would probably start, again, it depends on species. Cockatiels, they usually are you know, happy, you know. Um, Amazons might be a little bit more excited and you gotta watch them. African greys, you know, I wouldn't get them too close. So, you know, like with my guys, what you can do is start slowly moving them into the room. Um, when I first got Abby, uh, I had my other guys, they had a dedicated area in my old living room in New Jersey. And I had Abby on the complete opposite side. And she was on her stand and the birds were on their stand. They could see each other, they could hear each other, but they were probably 15 feet apart. Little by little, I've started moving her over and they, they did fine. Awesome. Little at a time. So I, I, I kind of about, like Lisa, what would you recommend, like the steps you could take to bring, when you, when you welcome a, a, an adopted bird into your home to make them feel the most secure would it be like really paying attention to where you place the cage, you know, like not directly in front of a window, they have a space they can retreat to, and then baby steps on, you know, moving them into the main room, wherever you're gonna house right. them. Actually. If you have a bird you're bringing home, you're not gonna put them in the middle of the room, you're not gonna put them in front of the TV or in front of the window where there's so much other stuff going on that's even gonna scare them more. I try to always keep my guys against some sort of wall and they always have something they can hide behind but I would put them in a quieter area where they can observe everything that's going on, okay? That's probably be the best. This way they can get used to, you know, different people walking through. I suggest people always acknowledge the bird. I mean, just like a human, you wouldn't walk through a room and not say something to somebody sitting on a couch. So you make sure you acknowledge the bird, talk to them softly, let them know that you're not going to hurt them and that will help them adjust into a different different home okay and i was imagining as well like if you were to say bring home if you were to adopt an african gray that's um never had a wing feather trim or you know like 
it's something that's so abrupt, like all of a sudden it goes from one environment to now it's feathers are trimmed, like, like those kind of things to take in consideration on how you acclimate them to a new environment. Right, yeah. so if, if you have a bird that is fully flighted, I would suggest keeping the bird in a smaller room <laughs> while yeah. it's getting used to the house, okay? So not necessarily your bedroom because you don't want them to pick up stuff, but if you have another sitting room or something that's smaller, that can be closed off. So this way, if the bird comes out, if it gets spooked, if it takes flight, it's not gonna know where to land. It's gonna hit something. So in a smaller room, the bird doesn't have as far to go and as much speed to pick up. And hopefully, I mean, every bird that I know has taken off, every single one when it's in its new home, because something spooks them. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're used to it every day. We might hear the phone ring, but it's a different tone to them. So they don't, they're not used to it and it spooks them. Or, you know, we're used to that car driving past, but they're not. So there's a lot of different things. So if, you ha if you're able to take a bird that is flighted and have them in a smaller room and try to acclimate them there, and after you get them out, after you get them used to your hand, if you take them out into another area, little by little, a couple feet more, a couple feet more each time, and get them used to it that way. And then hopefully, you know, they'll be out and you can see that they're relaxed and they want to be part of the, the area. Then you move them into their, their designated area. Okay. Um, and then Gail had a question for you. Um, Gail says, I know it's recommended to set up a caretaker for our grays before it becomes vital. So what, what steps would one go through to find the best homes for our babies beforehand? Okay, so... I'm not sure if you mean why you're traveling or in the event something happens to us. Um, there are wills, what was that? It, it, I think it might be the, the, if something were to happen, like if you needed to okay. find something for your birds. But. Okay, so I have a will drawn up. Um, I don't have kids. These are my family behind me. And I have private homes set up because I know my guys would do well in a private situation. But if they fall through, I also have a backup where I've talked to some rescues and they would be willing to take them in. Granted, they will have money that goes with them or they will have like all my, my collectibles, things I've gotten through the years, they will be sold or donated to take care of the birds. Um, you, you don't want to have it to the point where you don't, you're the only one and you're the only one taking care of the bird. The bird needs to be set up somehow. I did, when I had the store in New Jersey, I did have a client that would come in all the time, tell me about his bird. And one day, people I've never met before came in and they said, my client died and they have this bird and they don't know what to do with it. Now I felt responsible because this was my client, that was his bird. I was able to place that bird in a home probably within 20 minutes. Um, I've done that twice with people that just walked in this, in my door and said, you know, I don't know what to do with this bird. Uh, the bird is still in, his, in her home, even though she's got some language on her. <laughs> um, but it's important to make sure you set it up, whether you make, you know, have something notarized to put in your will, you know, don't be afraid to contact these rescues, but again, know that the responsible thing, if we can, as a caregiver, is to make sure that we're not just asking these um, sanctuary and rescues to take my bird. Make sure, if you can, there's a little bit of, of money to go with them. Um, I, I can't tell you how many people have asked me to take in their birds, and I physically cannot. Um, I'm in people's wills to help them out but not to physically bring them in my house. Um, you know, you, you have to make sure they're taken care of because you don't know what tomorrow brings. Sure. All right, um, and then Kim, uh, um, Kim says, I have a Congo African gray with an unknown history. She has a marked uh, bracelet that is round like a piece of wire instead of uh, sitting flat on her ankle. Does this mean that she was wild caught and older? Yes. So the, the oh, band wow. on the foot. Yes, it is wild caught. Hold on one minute. Sydney. Hush. Um, 
Yes, the, the when it's more of like a wire looking versus a flat, it is a wild caught import. There should be um, some numbers on there if you're able to see them. If you want to contact me and send me the information, I could try to look it up to see where what port the bird came in through. Um, what importation stopped in 1991. So that would probably mean that the bird is older. Now, there are some breeders who have gotten birds older and they crimp the band on versus putting it on as a baby over the foot. So you might have that, but again, numbers on the band, which is your proof of ownership. So you never give that out online. But if you send it to me privately, I can try to look it up and see if you can find out or contact them to see how old. Okay. Um, and that's interesting. Um, uh, and then Michelle, um, Michelle says, love the Gabriel Foundation. Um, I've boarded there twice. Uh, they're wonderful with all the birds. I've actually been there. It's a great facility uh, myself. Um, awesome. what, what do you suggest for a donation for, a, for sanctuary care? My gray is 16 and my will to go to the Gabriel Foundation and they require a donation for sanctuary birds, but I have no idea how to calculate that now as time goes by, um, the older she gets. That's an interesting, yeah, that's an interesting question. Like, how do you calculate the usually, life care costs? Usually the rescues or the sanctuaries will calculate that for you. Um, I've been to Project Perry. I think they're fantastic. Um, I've been there and helped them with the aviary and volunteered there. And I think, I think everybody should go and volunteer somewhere because it's gonna change your outlook on the birds. Um, they will calculate depending on how bird, how old your bird is, the health of the bird, and how much longer the bird has to go. So while while I can say I don't know five thousand, um, that's just a guess. I'm lying. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, it's yeah. what they are going to base it on. Okay. Hold on, I have to get Sydney because he's being a little mouthy. <laughs> hey, which one's? Uh, let's see. Let's see, where's Sydney at? Oh, in the back. There we go. Hi, Sydney. <laughs> yeah, he's just being a little loud. Yeah, you can say hello. <laughs> so, so we have to, uh, so Donna, Donna asks, how can we train um, a barbering cogno African gray, African gray to wear a soft collar without crazy thrashing? Uh, medically perfect adopted trauma survivor and 17 years old. Okay, so the first thing is I'm going to say you have to go to a vet. That vet will fit the collar um, to your bird, okay? You want to make sure it's not too long. You want to make sure it's not too tight. And then there are people that will actually work with vets and or you, depending on the size of the bird, to make a soft collar. But know that... Collars are not normal. The birds know this. So imagine if a comb was put on you, you'd probably get just a little bit nervous too. So when a vet fits a bird for a collar, they observe the bird. They don't just put the collar on and send them home. And the birds lay there, they lay on their side, they lay on their back, you know. And it, some of them have been real drama queens. And a couple of my clients with different species of birds have had to put collars on through the years. And they'll call me and they'll say, oh, the bird's just laying there. It won't eat. It won't drink. It won't eat. It's laying on its side. What's wrong? I'm like, it's being a drama queen. And the, co and the collar was put on by a vet. So they want to observe them, make sure it's correct. And after a certain time, I don't want anybody to just go out and buy a collar and stick it on. But after a certain period, and it's usually 48 hours, the bird starts to act a little bit more normal. So, and I've been pretty spot on with most people. Yeah, I know Sydney, right? Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I thought I was familiar with it. I never had a bird with a collar, but how, how long does the bird, like during the day it was wearing a collar? Is it the entire day or is it? It depends. Now, I just happen to be sitting here. This is part of a collar. It's an acrylic collar. This came from a vet, okay? And it just happens to go on this bird, okay? You can see, he likes to pluck out. Now, all the neck, 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 his neck feathers are bright red. 
So now it's pretty much just normal that he pulls them out because he knows he's not supposed to have them there. But this bird has anxiety issues and anxiety separation. And there's times where he does need to wear a collar. If he is, okay, for instance, when my husband was deployed for two years, this bird was calm, he was fine, we didn't have any issues. But then when my husband comes home, the bird wants to be near him constantly, wants to be sitting on him. And if he's not, and my husband happens to walk through the room, the bird starts screaming and starts ripping. So my husband's bathroom has always been right next to the bird room. So Sydney can hear him in the middle of the night, and that's when he pulls out his feathers. So depending on the issue, if it's a medical issue, the bird might have to wear it 24-7. If it's another issue deemed by your medical team, you may only need it at night. So depends. All right. Um, next question is from Julia. And first of all, she says, thank you for offering this helpful and informative webinar. Um, we, we do um, our will to include our feather baby. How much money per month um, we will do the best we can would be appropriate to leave in our will to the caretaker we leave our baby with. Of course, I know this varies depending on how much money a person has. But if you were to budget out, let's say like a monthly budget for saving away. For, for one bird, mm -hmm. owning a store, I can tell you, you know, roughly what it would run. I would say if you did a hundred, that'll cover the food. It'll cover some decent toys for the month. And they may be able to take a little bit and put it into an account if something happens medically. So I think that would be a good start if you're able to afford it. I think a hundred would be good. Okay. And maybe even think about, I don't know if anyone's ever done this, but maybe like uh, in, invest in some kind of build a nest egg, so to speak, uh, retirement fund for your bird on the, <laughs> some funds. Exactly. Exactly. And, I, and there are, you are able to get um, health insurance on birds when they're younger. Now, Sydney actually has it, as does Emma. And I need to leave the next person enough money per month to keep that policy you know and it's i only have the emergency it's only 14.99 but i want to make sure that person could afford to pay the 14.99 for 10 years so this way the bird has health insurance that's true that's important you're taking yeah yeah um okay and then teresa had she had a, a an insightful comment she says uh you know, adopted a um, from the now defunct World Parrot Refuge on um, in Van on Vancouver Island, uh, BC, Canada, almost five years ago. Uh, no idea how old our guy is. Uh, great health and feather. It's baby steps each day. Very cage protective. Very chatty and enjoys our company. Uh, the cage is in the living room. Only likes head uh, head scratches um, when his cage uh, is even with the door. Oh, when in the cage, even with the door open. He'll return to the cage for these. Um, hopeful in time, hopefully in time, he'll accept these outside the cage or not. <laughs> so. Well, it, it really depends. Um, I have Sammy and she, I, I can flip her over. I can do anything with her, but I can't really scratch her head. So she'll put her head down and I'll go to scratch and she brings her head up like, nope, 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 I can't decide that. So I don't know what it is. Um, it could be something in the background um, that he's more afraid and he feels more secure inside the cage. You can certainly keep trying. I mean, as long as the bird is, you know, secure and, and happy. I mean, I try every day with Sam and I get the same result. So, yeah, yeah. And, and I know Sam, Somebody said to me who knew my friend Trudy, Sam has never known a day without love. She's always been spoiled, taken care of, and just handled with the softest and gentle hands. But yet she doesn't want her head scratched. Or maybe the previous owner was left-handed and the birds used to the left hand coming in. And now you're trying to do it with the right hand. Right. It could be something as simple as that, but 
You know, Sam can be laying upside down in my arms with her feet in the air, you know, nudging me to scratch her and I'll tickle her and she'll bring her head away. Like, nope, nope, can't happen. Hey, so maybe that might warrant a, um, a legacy video that you could show you yourself interacting with your bird. So then the next person, if you, you know, would yes. have some idea of how your bird likes interactions from you. That right, and there's also, uh, well, it, it may not like it from the next person. Um, because know that Sam never flipped over for anybody else. Um, she didn't like to snuggle, but she enjoys our time at night. But another helpful thing to do as well is to keep a journal. And this way, God forbid something happens to you or you need to rehome your bird, the next person or the sanctuary that or the rescue that has to take them has all this documentation. They can know a little bit about medical. They can know it doesn't like the color red. Um, prefers this food and it just makes it easier and you know I, I have a, I have a little bit of a journal for everybody and it comes in handy as well for a bird sitter. Yeah so, I know that, that a food journal like having an idea of what your bird's diet has been prior to you adopting it is very key to knowing what you need to what you might want to work on correcting and also what your bird will take as food. <laughs> Right, exactly, because there's enough stress getting into a new home. Now, I know a lot of times when a bird gets into a new home, there's going to be a little bit of a honeymoon phase, and that's where the bird is really being a little bit more gentle and friendly, feeling everybody out, okay? Um, you, eat, you can have a terrified bird that won't go near anybody, or you can have a really super friendly bird that wants to come out and be on you and play with you and talk to you from minute one yeah but they're also trying to figure out their place you know and, who, and who's the fun one and who we can take advantage of a little more and you know who comes running when we call that kind of stuff <laughs> so uh, those are very good points um well i have to announce today's winner of our we i don't know if i mentioned it earlier but of course when we do these webinar series we do a giveaway um of, of some lefebvre foods so uh today's winner um, you're going to be sent a bag of tropical fruit pellets as well as a bag of Lefebvre um, food of your bird's choice. And today's winner is Adrian M. So Adrian, uh, congratulations. Someone from the Lefebvre office will reach out to you uh, early next week to send that off to you. Um, oh, who's this? <laughs> this is Sam. I figured because we were talking about her, I would, I would bring her oh. up. See, like, you know, I can pretty much do anything, but she's not going to let me tickle her. Just not happening. Oh, yeah. yeah. She, she's so gentle and so sweet. But no, there's just no tickling happening. <laughs> right? Can you say hello? And how long in, how long again have you had Sam? Uh it's gonna be four years in July. So but she's actually give me a spit part. But see, I can flip her over. And she's, you know, she's fine. It's just that tickle thing ain't happening. <laughs> so to each their own. Everyone's got their, you know, little right. variants. And, so and again, no, I don't really let birds on shoulders, but I'm sitting here, my arm's stable, and I'm not going anywhere. And we're talking about her. So she's very cute. Um, and, the, and all the birds that behave, they are all so well. They're just chilling on their, on their, on their beautiful setup behind you there. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, we try. Yeah. So, uh, I think that's what looks like, um, that's all the, the time we have to, for today for questions and everything. Um, I just want to remind everybody that, uh, we'll be back again, uh, next Friday. Um, we'll do a heart to heart session with, uh, Chris Davis. So, um, so that'll be exciting as well as the following Friday, we'll be on with um, Dr. Lamb and she's gonna tell us what it takes to be an avian veterinarian. So those are some uh, more interesting topics for y'all to, to log on um, and tune into. Um, so uh, Lisa, thank you again for your time today and for walking us through that. This is an important step that, um, you know, even, either you're adopting or you're, you know, taking steps to secure your bird a happy future uh, in case that's needed, so. Right. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out to me. And I'm always here to help get an older bird and a new home. Okay. So uh, if you do have a question for Lisa, um, you can send an email to customer service at, at lefebvre.com. And if you could just put uh, 
Lisa Bono and the and African Gray and the and the subject line to have, make it easier for us to find it. Uh, that would be awesome. So, so there we go. Uh, well, that went by so quick. <laughs> and no, it's, no troubles with the the presentation this time. So that's good. No, it was no glitches at all. And that's actually kind of makes these webinars more fun and interesting. At least you never know. You know all these these live webinars. Something you know that goes off script. It makes it. Somewhat fun, but it was perfect. We had no issues with seeing your screen at all. So, congratulations on that. I I know it it tech. I'm not that kind of person that can overcome that. Oftentimes, what we did today. So yay. <laughs> um, so everyone, at least again, thank you so much. Um, everyone, thank you for joining us today, and uh, we'll see you next time. Um, in the meantime, everyone have a great weekend. Uh, all the best to you and your flock, and stay safe. Bye. Thank you. Bye.